So welcome back again to another edition. And tonight, we're going to be discussing the issue of communitarianism and individualism. And in preparing for this, I read a volume entitled Communitarianism and Individualism, which has a collection of essays that take different points of view on the issue that we are going to be diving into very directly. Uh, some of the authors in this volume are Michael Sandel, Charles Taylor, Alastair McIntyre, Michael Waltzer, Amy Gutman, Robert Nozick, David Gauthier, Will Kimlicka, and John Rawls. And these are certainly big names and names that are referred to quite often when it comes to this topic. And after reading through most of these articles and skimming through a couple that I thought were less productive for me, um, I've decided at the end to focus more um, distinctly on Michael Sandel's argument in an article titled The Procedural Republic and the Unencumbered Self. And in this article, Sandel makes a few interesting claims. I think one of the difficulties in reading the article is that one of the things he does is he argues against the liberal conception of the self. And in doing so, hits on so many ideas about the liberal self and the reasons for taking the idea of an independent, autonomous self that's capable of willing and reasoning on its own outside of any claim a community and the interests of the community might have upon it that um, I think he might pull quite a few readers into actually affirming liberalism and perhaps missing some of the good points, some of the strengths that could be brought out of the communitarian position. And that's certainly the way that I experienced reading the article for myself. Um, so one of the major claims that Sandel makes is that the liberal conception of the self is one that necessitates viewing the right as prior to the good. Now, this this occurs within the context of the liberal political theory um, of the self in the environment of leading up to the French Revolution and in the attempt to justify the idea of a political order that could pave the way for more of a democratic society. The idea that an individual should be treated as good for him or herself, regardless of whatever use the state might be able to make of him or her. Um, the classic formulation of that is, is simply that individuals should not be treated as means, but only as ends, only as good, as, as good for their own sake. We should never look upon individuals from a political standpoint as being merely instrumental, merely as being good for something, for some good that the state has established that we need to strive for. The individual always has priority. The individual always has to be left with the freedom of choice in deciding what sorts of ends are appropriate for themselves, even if they work counter to the ends of the state, uh, whatever good the state has conceived. And the alternative to that, it would seem, would be some form of totalitarianism or tyranny, some sort of state-enforced coercion to make people act in a certain way, even if their reason tells them otherwise. And uh, in a liberal political order, the idea that our rights entitle us to um, have our rationality respected in the form of uh, our right to publish our views, um, freedom of speech, um, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of religion, all makes that capacity of individual reason and the right to object and to act um, contrary to whatever our political leaders 
um, political goals our leaders uh, leave us with, uh, it, it gives us a basis for doing so. Uh, this was the basis for uh, civil rights movements as well as for people protesting against the Vietnam War and even for the very um, Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution itself. Um, and a lot of these ideas were, in fact, articulated by Immanuel Kant. And um, a lot of these ideas, as I said, you know, just seem so commonsensically right, especially looking at the 20th century in the rearview mirror. It seems almost as a matter of, uh, you know, common sense to just say that the right should be taken to be prior to the good in a political order. Because in those scenarios where we've taken the good to be prior to the right, um, where the good means uh, some sort of um, some sort of goal that's been established over and above individual rights, and that trumps individual rights, allows the state legitimizes the state in coercing the individual to act in its interests rather than its own, his own interests as he perceives them is um, just simply the road to totalitar totalitarianism and tyranny. I mean, this is exactly what we fought against in World War II. Um, this is exactly the road to an authoritarian society that it's hard to think anyone who comes from a liberal society like ours could be brought to agree with. You know, as I was saying earlier, one of the challenges that I felt in reading this article was really to, to try to develop a strong enough sense of Sandel's argument to pose counterweight to um, my own feelings that it uh, should be taken as a matter of course, that the right should be thought of as being prior to the good, that, that individual rights should supersede any sort of... Um, good that's any notion of good that's developed outside of the individual and that individual rights should be uh, respected as a bulwark against tyranny authoritarianism and the to the kind of totalitarian societies that developed in the 20th century that led to all sorts of horrible horrible abuses of people um you know i guess we need only mention figures like Hitler and Stalin to see where all that goes. So I'm going to actually read a little bit more out of this article than I usually do to try to give some substance to this and to contextualize um, the flow of the argument as I see it. So on page 13, Sandel writes, this liberalism says, in other words, that what makes the just society just is not the telos or purpose or end at which it aims, but precisely its refusal to choose and advance among competing purposes and ends. In its constitution and its laws, the just society seeks to provide a framework within which its citizens can pursue their own values and ends consistent with similar liberty for others. Okay, and I believe that substantiates the... the um, the idea of the good and the right and, and how, the, the, how a liberal society puts the right before the good that seems so um, justified. Sandel writes, the ideal that I've described might be summed up in the claim that the right is prior to the good and in two senses. The priority of the right means first that individual rights cannot be sacrificed for the sake of the general good. In this, it opposes utilitarianism. And second, that the principles of justice that specify these rights cannot be premised on any particular vision of the good life. Okay. Um, now, to try to develop this argument a little bit more and then to pose his objections to it, Sandel brings forward John Rawls and Immanuel Kant. Um, and he points out that these are the two people who are perhaps most responsible for providing the philosophical foundations for the liberal ideal. Rawls would be the one most responsible for 
establishing it as a uh, contemporary theory of the liberal society and uh, Kant for the classical theory. So Sandel um, writes out his argument in the following points. First, the liberal society has a deep and powerful philosophical appeal. Second, despite its philosophical force, the claim for the priority of the right over the good ultimately fails. And third, despite its philosophical failure, this liberal vision is the one by which we live. And Sandel will go on to say that what's motivating him is a concern that our society has become too individualistic, that we've lost a sense of ourselves as being members of a community. And it's really only by challenging the idea that the right is prior to the good and finding a way in which to conceive of the good as prior to the right, the rights of the individual, that we can work our way back to some sort of philosophically grounded way of thinking of ourselves as obligated to the community to do what is in the interest of the community, even if it supersedes our own good, even to the point where the needs of the community will dictate that it is morally wrong uh, to do otherwise. Um, in the liberal political um, theory, in liberal political theory, we're always free to choose how to decide in such situations, but Sandel seems to want to try to develop a way of theorizing a case where the individual is obligated to act in the interests of the community in such a way that it supersedes the question about what his individual rights are. That seems difficult to me, but let's proceed with this. Uh, at the very end of the introduction, um, Sandel writes, as I will try to argue now, what makes this ethic so compelling, but also finally vulnerable, are the promise and the failure of the unencumbered self. So what he means by that term, unencumbered self, is, is an idea of the self that is unencumbered by ties to the community, um, such that a liberal individual can um, reason within himself or herself in such a way that the uh, ties to the community, moral obligations to those around himself or herself uh, do not in any way uh, supersede the right that he has to act in his own interest. But let's see how Sandel works this out. Sandel writes, according to Kant, the right is, quote, derived entirely from the concept of freedom in the external relationships of human beings and has nothing to do with the end which all men have by nature. In other words, the end of achieving happiness or with the recognized means of attaining this end, unquote. As such, it must have a basis prior to all empirical ends. That is the right to choose one's own ends. Only when I am governed by principles that do not presuppose any particular ends, am I free to pursue my own ends consistent with a similar freedom for all. But this still leaves open the question of what the basis of the right could possibly be. It must be a basis prior to all purposes and ends, unconditioned even by what Kant calls, quote, the special circumstances of human nature, where could such a basis conceivably be found? Given the stringent demands of the Kantian ethic, the moral law would seem almost to require a foundation in nothing, for any empirical condition would undermine its priority. Duty asks Kant at his most ly lyrical, quote, what origin is there worthy of thee, and where is to be found the root of thy noble descent, which proudly rejects all kinship with the inclinations. 
So this is exactly where we enter into Kant's justification for the autonomous individual. And as Sandel recognizes, but perhaps not fully recognizes in some ways, is that the point at which an individual, according to Kant, and as we'll see later for Rawls, is able to abstract from the ties that he or she would feel toward a community is precisely wherein the mind is able to reason freely for itself. So this is a point where the notion of the self becomes controversial in this argument. Is there a way that we can see, can conceive of the self at any point in any way, shape, or form as being truly unencumbered, truly without an obligation to um, the community, but free to choose for itself? Is there a sense that we can think of the self as not constituted by the community that it comes from and therefore as obligated to that community? Is there a way, if we push this issue even further, that we can think of the self as somehow being outside the circumstances of its own um, social and historical circumstances? And it seems like if we push this far enough it becomes less and less um, um, obvious that the self is not conditioned by the circumstances in which it is created. Uh, don't we as individuals actually owe the community quite a lot for our ability to reason and think? Aren't we in fact constituted by the community in which we've grown up and in which we develop? in such a way that we actually do owe our capacity to reason and think and decide what's of benefit to us and to accrue those benefits only as members of a community. And wherein do we find the idea of individuality as, uh, as something that's outside of that community or outside of our uh, development in history. And this is a point where Kant tries to advance the notion of pure reason as a faculty that we can appeal to to try to find the individuality of the individual. The pure individuality of the individual, you could say, is bound up with the possibility of pure reason for Kant. And for Kant, as for somebody like Descartes, or even for somebody like Plato, this is going to involve being able to abstract from all particular circumstances of one's place and time and to appeal to pure reason itself. Um, Kant's, Kant's argument is considerably more complicated than that. And uh, without making a, a detour into the details of that argument, um, Kant, just like Descartes before him, really ultimately appeals to our capacity as individuals to be able to reason for ourselves and to try to get outside of our own subjectivity by appealing to reason as something that has a kind of transpersonal force. So to put it very, very briefly, our experience itself is conditioned by elements of our subjectivity that have a transcendental aspect. So the most clear and concrete example that I could give would be something like looking at a pencil or a pen or a book and within that perception of that object, having a concept of unity or of substance and and it just the fact of the latency of that concept within our perceptual experience allows for a connection with a form of objectivity 
that allows us to create systems like geometry and arithmetic, which can be considered as purely a priori in the sense that we don't have to appeal to experience in order to validate the truth of the claims that are made within those systems. It's really something about the way our minds are constructed, something about our humanity itself that is latent in the way that we perceive the world that allows for those systems of reasoning to develop, to develop in such a way that all we need to do is to appeal to reason to establish the truth of the claims that they make. So if we have two units and another two units, and if we put our fingers together and count them, we can immediately see that we have four units. And that is a priori true in the sense that we don't need to appeal to experience to know that it is universally true, that it's universally valid whenever that sort of claim would be made. And it's in that sense that we have a capacity for trans personal transcendent reasoning. And it's that kind of reasoning that Kant appeals to when he develops his ideal of the categorical imperative. It's, it's his appeal to pure reason that allows him to ground this radical ideal of objectivity um, for morality and a radical ideal of um, the capacity of the individual to really and truly uh, think for himself by appealing to something beyond himself so that he can transcend the um, particular circumstances of his existence. So something like the categorical imperative is an example of that, where someone could say, if the moral principle that I believe in is truly universalizable, that is, if everyone were to do what I'm suggesting as a moral principle could be advocated without running into any obvious contradiction, then the principle could become a universalizable moral principle. So you can see there a way in which Kant is trying to ground some sort of objectivity that allows us to really think about the individual as autonomous, and that in turn allows us to begin in a political framework to begin to shape an argument around the idea that individual rationality must be respected because we are capable as human beings of that, that this is part of what it means to be human. Okay, now when it comes to John Rawls, we have a similar kind of appeal to reason, but it is uh, slightly different. And that arises in what is known as the original position. And very briefly, the original position involves a thought experiment. Uh, Rawls asks us to imagine a group of individuals who are gathered together prior to the creation of a social order that they are going to participate in, um, who have been stripped of all uh, social rank, social ties, um, prior obligations to their community, um, who have no way of determining what sort of future they might have together as individuals to decide what sort of society they would like to live in and what sort of ideals that society would want to hold up for itself. And the situation works very well with the idea of the Kantian categorical imperative because it's an appeal to a kind of reasoning that lies outside of one's particular social circumstances. And it tries to invoke the question of, is there a way to reason toward some rational principle of society that would ground the principle that what's good for me can only be justified with regard to 
some conception of it also being um, something that everyone else should regard as good as well. Or what is to my advantage potentially should also be advantageous to uh, made available as something advantageous to others. So for example, in the original position, if someone decided that uh, we should have a society where inequality was allowed, Rawls would argue that the participants in the original position scenario would likely decide against that because while it might be advantageous for some people to be on the advantageous end of inequality, anyone who's participating in the original position would also have to confront the possibility of being in a disadvantaged position as a result of inequality. And if you add in the, the idea, the possibility that you could have generations of people who are um, more and more disadvantaged as a result of social inequality, you can start to see how unreasonable it would be for anyone in a position like the original position to try to found a society in which that might be possible for themselves or for their descendants. Another point that should be brought up about Rawls is the two principles of justice. And I'll read directly out of Sandel's account of this. Two principles of justice are these. First, equal basic liberties for all. And second, only those social and economic inequalities that benefit the least advantaged members of society. And this is the difference principle. And I think it would be perhaps more clear if Sandel's text were to read um, those social and economic inequalities that accrue in society should be the very sorts of inequalities that benefit the least advantaged members of society the most. So that is the, the difference principle. Okay, and not to dwell on that too much, I think let's move directly on to a couple of Sandel's objections. One main point to, to make about this is that Sandel points out that for Rawls, the concept of desert um, as having deserved what you have earned by, uh, by virtue of your efforts, it kind of falls, falls short in Rawls's scheme. So he writes, we deserve as individuals neither the talents our good fortune may have brought nor the benefits that flow from them. We should therefore regard these talents as common assets and regard one another as common beneficiaries of the rewards they bring. And you can already see how there might be a conflict between individual rights and being able to distribute uh, the goods, the property that accrues to uh, individuals as a result of their own efforts, or even as the chance may be purely from luck. And what um, Sandel is going to point out is that this conflict between individual rights and the idea of uh, distributing people's property for the sake of benefiting other people in society, in effect promoting a communitarian idea, is not something that can be harmonized with the idea of individual liberty itself as something that needs to be respected. So um, here's another quote from Sandel. On the cooperative vision of community alone, it is unclear what the moral basis for this sharing could be. Short of the constitutive conception, deploying the individual's assets for the sake of the common good would seem an offense against the plurality and distinctness this liberalism seeks above all to secure. Um, reading the paragraph immediately above it, I think, also helps to establish the point Sandel writes, the difference principle, like utilitarianism, is a principle of sharing. As such, it, pressed, it must presuppose some prior moral tie among those whose assets it would deploy and whose efforts it would enlist in a common endeavor. Otherwise, 
It is simply a formula for using some as means to others' ends, a formula this liberalism is committed to rejecting. So does Sandel have a point here? And I think he does, strictly speaking, that there is nothing in the liberal conception of the self or in the in uh, liberal political theory that actually necessitates anyone to act in the interest of a community and that this is a problem for John Rawls's theory, that, that there is a sense in which the liberty of the individual in being free to dispose of their property in whatever way they see fit or to object to it on... Um, philosophical, uh, on a philosophical level, or to express themselves as um, being opposed to it and acting upon that objection is not something that can be grounded within the uh, liberal framework. That the idea that such an individual would be morally obligated to their community to take whatever wealth they've acquired and distribute to other people in the community is not something that can be grounded purely within liberal political theory itself because the right of the individual is always going to trump whatever sorts of claims society might try to make on that individual. So the liberal individual can always say that they don't agree with uh, any redistribution of their wealth, that they don't want to do it. We can make a law about it, but that would only violate that person's rights. And so perhaps the law itself that says an individual's income should be redistributed through taxation is in itself something that might conceivably be considered unconstitutional if it goes directly against the um, basic rights of the individual. And, you know, I think Sandel does have a point here. And if that is a valid, if that's a sound counterargument to Rawls's point, then perhaps it is a solid argument against liberal theory itself. And one way of thinking about this that I think helps bring through uh, Sandel's point here is to think about a situation where it makes a lot more clear and evident sense. It's, it's more commonsensical to think of a person as being a member of a community and as uh, obligated to distribute their wealth to the community. So if we think about a situation like a tribe, and I've heard that the Ubuntu tribe um, is a tribe where people think of themselves as primarily constituted by the community. Um, I've come in contact with people who um, are from small tribes in Southeast Asia who seem to have much more openness toward their community obligations and feel that, that perhaps they are actually constituted um, much more strongly by their community ties than we are. And if you think about a situation like... Um, if somebody goes out hunting, and perhaps if they kill an antelope, uh, in that situation, the individual who kills the antelope, it would seem is much more straightforwardly and commonsensically obligated to bring the antelope back to the community to make sure that he shares his wealth, the animal that he's killed, with the other members of the tribe so that nobody goes hungry. And it makes a lot less sense to think of that individual is titled to simply keep the antelope all to himself, run off into the hills somewhere, and uh, just simply collect the, the wealth for himself and not share it with anyone. In a uh, society like ours, it's much more difficult to see how that makes sense. If somebody buys a car, it's their car. If somebody rents an apartment, it's their apartment. If somebody buys a house, it's their house. We don't consider those as community goods. We don't consider those as uh, common goods that belong to the community. Um, but we consider them to be our own personal goods. That's our property. Um, what's in our bank account? 
Should that also be considered our property? I mean, it's a very simple kind of extension from one type of thinking about property to another. You know, my car is my car. It doesn't belong to other people. Um, the money in my bank account is my money. It doesn't belong to other people. But if I'm a member of a tribe and I think of myself as constituted as an individual by that tribe, and if I think of a, myself as having a moral obligation, a clear and evident moral obligation that supersedes uh, my own personal benefit, then it makes much more straightforward sense for me to simply go back and uh, serve the common good by making sure that everyone sees the antelope that I've killed and in return, I simply get respect and honor as a good hunter. And it's difficult to see how um, we can bridge the gap from the situation that we have where it's much more commonsensical to think of ourselves as um, holders of individual rights that are inalienable to a situation where we have an obligation to our community that trumps those individual rights. And it's there, perhaps, in the idea of rights, in the idea of right itself, where perhaps the bifurcation really occurs and those two worlds don't, uh, are unable to meet one another again. It seems like we absolutely need the idea of individual rights to live in a nation state. Once we say that a state rather than a tribe uh, where, it, where it might work a little bit more easily has the right to choose ends for us rather than ourselves, all sorts of injustices follow from that. But in a tribe, in a tribal setting, it's perhaps a little bit easier to justify. Although even in that situation, I'm not sure that it, it won't fall into difficulties. If individuals are not allowed, if they're not permitted or encouraged, um, if the, um, the right to think for oneself and express one's own views is not something that is um, allowed in society, then the possibility for totalitarian tyranny, authoritarian rule is always possible. And in such a scenario, society may remain stagnant for quite a while. I think ultimately, one of the main problems with Sandel's argument is that he doesn't quite grasp that the individual that Kant and Rawls have in mind is an individual whose identity is actually grounded not in the total unencumbrance of the self, but in their capacity to appeal directly to a kind of reasoning that could take on some sort of transpersonal aspect. So this is the kind of reasoning that Descartes tried to engage with and Kant tried to engage with when they tried to break with tradition and circumstance and think differently and do things differently and try to pave the way for democratic societies to be created that hadn't existed in, in Europe up until that time. And... Um, you know, had to be founded through revolution in the case of the French Revolution. And I don't think that Sandel has quite understood the liberal self in a nuanced enough way. I think that Sandel is simply thinking of the self as being matter-of-factly encumbered by its social circumstances, whereas... If the liberal conception of the self is to succeed, then that appeal to some kind of reasoning that can abstract from one's individual circumstances has to be something that can be appealed to. And that is exactly where the individuality, ultimately, of the um, liberal self can be found, because that is the true... Uh, source of the freedom of the liberal individual.
Um, so for Descartes, the highest expression of freedom is not found in simply being um, unencumbered by, you know, let's say one's physical circumstances, like maybe being locked in prison somewhere or something like that. But the highest form of freedom is something that no one can take away from the individual, which is to be able to reason within themselves freely. And that is exactly where the liberty of the individual is truly grounded in the Enlightenment tradition. And it's that freedom, the freedom of reason, that the Enlightened tradition, the Enlightenment tradition seeks to ground and make a primary um, principle of any enlightened political order. So with that, I think I'll close the book on this week's reading of Sandel. And perhaps um, more can be said about this, but for the time being, I'm simply going to leave it with these conclusions that the difference principle uh, is in conflict with the idea of liberal autonomy. But I don't think that ultimately poses a threat to liberal political theory itself. So with that, I'm just going to say goodbye for tonight and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>